Welcome to Talking Hoosier Baseball. Uh, we are recording this on Friday, December 30th, 2022. I am Carl James, joined by Chris Feeney, Josh Bennett, Cassidy Palmer, and our very special guest, Indiana University baseball head coach, Jeff Mercer. Uh, Jeff Mercer is now in his fifth year as head coach at Indiana. The 2023 team includes four position players uh, from the 2022 Big Ten All-Freshman team. There are a lot of new faces, particularly on the mound. In addition, the fall 2023 recruiting class uh, now has uh, nine national letters of intent signed. Um, coach Mercer, welcome back to Talking Hoosier Baseball. I hope you and your family had a, a Merry Christmas. We did. We had a wonderful Christmas, and uh, we were, were, were very, very fortunate and blessed. So, no, I, I, I'm excited to be back, and I appreciate the opportunity. Well, it's great to have you, Coach. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just dive right in. Uh, Chris will kick us off with the first question. All right. Thanks, Carl. Coach, now we've been through, you know, together, we haven't had the podcast this long, but we've been fans for a long time. You know, we had Tracy, we had Coach Lamonis, and now, you know, obviously yourself and your crew here. And it's been a different recruiting style, I really feel like, as it switched, you know, from one to the other to the other. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about, like, your guiding principles? Like, what's, you know, the meat and potatoes of, of what you want to bring a kid into this program, into your program? Yeah, I, I think the, the big thing for us immediately is, is always the tools. And, and we've always been um, very, uh, very heavily involved with just evaluating the physicality of the athlete. I know, and I know everybody is, but, you know, we look at a, a lot of, you know, ro rotational abilities. You're looking at hand size. You're looking at ankle mobility, hip mobility. A lot of those different things that are going to allow us to produce force. So when you go watch a guy play, is he does he have the ability to produce force into the future um, at, a, at a greater at a, at a greater rate than um, you know than most athletes, and, and it, does he have the physical upside to be able to continue to grow? Um, and once you have that, the, the big thing for us, I, we would rather have um, we would rather have you know ten to twelve guys, high school guys, that that we really believe have the the, the personal characteristics, have the um, the, the work ethic that have the desire uh, they, they truly want uh, or have a, have a personality that, that values to become the best that they can possibly be um, and, and I think that's a personality trait I, I don't think it's necessarily a baseball specific um, ability right you, you have people that are driven and motivated to be successful just in in, in their day-to-day -day life academically personally um, and, and baseball just happens to be their passion. So we're, we're very, very selective um, because just knowing the program and knowing the expectations, you know, the way that we handle the lifestyle, the way that we handle diet and nutrition, the way that we handle the weight room, um, the, the, the emphasis that we put on those things, it takes a very specific personality style and trait to, to really enjoy those things. So um, we, we would rather find the guys that have the physical tools um, and then the guys that have the the personality traits and the, and the desire to want to do those things, because I think if you put somebody in a in a position where they don't they don't fit, if the um, there's just so many different options, right? You can there's a lot of different programs, there's a lot of different players, um, and and if you if you find the right fit, you you have a great experience. And I think sometimes if if we try to force a situation where we don't have a great fit in those things. Um, it's it's not fair for anybody involved. So we, we try to be um, very specific in, in in those things. So I think you, you see that we're just kind of now as we've been going through it for, for several years, you kind of look at the accumulation of um, just the, the physicality of the team. And that's why I get really excited about for this year's team is just so physical and so athletic. Um, but it also really fits us from a culture standpoint of the work ethic, the intensity, the competitiveness, um, those things, they all kind of match together. Uh, so, Coach, building off of that, uh, not long ago, the National Letters of Intent were signed for the fall of 2023. Um, so you alluded to being excited about some of the guys in this class. So yeah. can you tell us as Hoosier fans uh, yeah. what we should be excited about? Yeah, the 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 2022 class was a, was a bigger pitching class. And sometimes you, you try to balance that on both sides. But when you look at the 22 class was was bigger on the mound. and It's a young class, too. So. Um, the 23 group was was always going to have a, a few more position players, but the good thing about this group is, I really like the arms that we have. You know, a couple of those Seth Bennis and um, and um, and Evan O'Neill, kind of the, the headline guys there for for guys that you look at and say, okay, these guys could could step in right away and compete on the mound. Really good fastball profiles, um, breaking balls, a lot like a 
Richard esque with a with a twelve six breaking ball. They they have other pitches that go along with it, but that down breaking ball, um, that vertical action, which is which is unique, right? And, and those things are really hard to to as a hitter um, to to manage. But we also have a couple of those guys that are going to be two way guys, Andrew Wiggins and, and Jason Oliver. Um, have a chance to do that. Uh, TJ Schuyler has a chance to be a two-way guy as well. So you get some depth on the mound um, with some of those position guys that truly have an opportunity to be two-way guys. Um, I, I like what I like about the class from the position player standpoint is it, it's it's very very athletic. It, it's really really twitchy. A lot of bursts, a lot of strength. Um, you know, you look at Andrew Wiggins obviously is a is a really talented you know, a top 25 or 30 guy in the country can really rotate, can accelerate long and athletic and strong. Uh, Jason Oliver is a really, really twitchy athletic kid. Um, that's going to be able to really rotate and, and, and do both for us. Braden Bakes um, is a, is a, an elite, elite, elite runner, um, an incredible athlete and strength. Hayden Carlson, same thing. Um, infielder uh, in for out of California, great athlete can really defend. Um, TJ Schuyler is a, is a terrific athlete, really defensive catcher, an elite thrower. We had Sean Murphy at, uh, at Wright State, and, and I'm not, um, you know, putting that on TJ to um, live up to that, that kind of billing. Um, but TJ is, has the very similar body type, a, a really similar thrower, long, um, you know, 6'3", 6'4", wide, you know, really huge hands. Um, an elite thrower. Cal Sefcik is another elite, elite runner. Um, his dad played uh, professional baseball for a long time. And so you, you start to look at some of those things and you can see really um, exciting you know, character traits physically. And then um, just a very, very serious group. And there's, and there's other good players in there too, but just a very, very serious group. Um, uh, uh, Personality wise, they, you know, I, I've been accused of, <laughs> of that over the course of my life of, of um, um, I don't want to be, say being obsessive, but being very focused and very, uh, uh, I don't hold two things in my head at once. It's usually about one thing at a time and, and you do that thing, one thing really well. And so I, I see a lot of those personality traits in, in those guys also, where they're, they're just very, very focused. They're very serious. They're very diligent. Um, and, and you put those personality traits together with, I mean, real athletes, you know, and I, and I don't say that very, often because you know there, there's only so many guys that are top five percent athletes and you know top one percent athletes there's just not enough of them to throw those terms around loosely but these these guys are elite elite athletes and and that's very very exciting now coach it's uh very striking how consistent uh the programs seem to be talent wise in general year to year yeah. uh with just a few exceptions how do you look at a sophomore in high school and determine if that guy is really power five level talent? Well, I think you, you go back to, to looking at physical traits. Um, you know, they, they don't lie. And, and that's, it, it can be difficult at times when you're, when you're trying to project so far in advance, but you know, a lot of times you're looking at mobility, right? How, how do I move? Do, do my hip, or my, do my ankles work correctly? Do my hips work correctly? As I run, do, does my gait correct? Do I swivel as I run? You know, how wide are my shoulders? You know, and do, do my shoulders slope forward? Are they pulled back correctly? You know, you're looking at arm length, you, the length from the elbow to the, to the wrist. You're looking at hand size. Um, all those different things where you're trying to really, really um, evaluate the physicality uh, of an athlete. You know, obviously, they're, they're family members. If, you know, I'm the oldest of four boys. And my, my dad played college sports. My mom played college sports. There, there, was a de- there was a decent idea that, you know, my brothers and I were going to play sports and going to be decent athletes because it was, you know, it was passed down. So, you know, you're looking at when, the, when they're younger players, uh, younger brothers, do they have older brothers that play? Did their dads play? You know, what do their parents look like? Are there other, you know, their parents, you know, if you're, if my dad is six foot six, there's a decent chance that, you know, that I'm going to be a, you know, a bigger kid, Right. When have I, when am I going to hit my growth spurt? Um, and, and some of those different things. So you're looking at a lot of it is physical projection. And, and then you, you're, you're looking at the attitude of a player. You're looking at the competitiveness of a player. And, and uh, you know, I'm a hitting guy, I'm an offensive guy, and that's not a, not a secret. But so when I go watch a guy play, I, I want to, I want to, I go watch almost all of our hitters, almost all of our position players. I will see, I'll see our pitchers too, but 
I'm going to go watch our position players play. And, um, you know, I, I want to see them play hard. I want to see them run the bases hard. I want to see them have an attitude. I want to see them care about winning. Um, you know, I don't really care about the theatrics. I don't really care about the the flair and, and all the extra stuff. It, it doesn't it doesn't impact winning. It doesn't impact scoring runs. Uh, I, I want to see a guy that, that when he swings, he hits the ball. And that, that's always like, it's always a, uh, well, I, that's an obvious statement, isn't it? Um, but but it's not it, when if a guy swings and misses in high school, he'll swing and miss in college. And if he swings and misses in college, he won't play professionally. So it just is what it is. So you 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 have to have um, that trait that 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 um, intrinsic or natural or whatever it is. When a guy swings the bat, he hits the ball consistently. Um, and the same thing on the mound is when when a guy throws the ball, he throws a strike consistently. And, and, and then ideally, you would like to have the, this fastball generate weak contact or swing and miss. If you have a fastball that generates weak contact or swing and miss, then you have a chance, right? You have a chance to, to create a profile off of that. And even if it's a, a little bit of a different profile than you would expect, you're, you always need value, right? You, you have not everybody's on 50%, right? It, it just can't work that way. So how do you create value? How do you look at a guy and project value? And a lot of that is based on does this fastball have a profile that you think could be unique? So I know that's a long-winded answer, but but to be able to accurately offer, you know, uh, you know, a, 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 a sophomore in high school, it is a thorough process to, to try to be right. And, and then to do, you know, obviously you want to, you want that to be a commitment that's going to bear fruit and it's probably not going to bear fruit for five years. So you, you, you need to make sure that you're doing everything you can to be right. Well, I think we think it's safe it's to say that the transfer portal has been a net positive for your program. Um, so what is your philosophy on transfer recruiting? You know, I, I, I was a transfer. So and I, I tell the story often. I, um, I, I was a walk on originally and I didn't, and I didn't have a whole lot of offers at high school. I had an injury. And so I transferred, I, I had a walk on opportunity. I met, I went, I made it end up being a good player and I transferred um, for for a, a better fit uh, for me, and it ended up being I went to Wright State, and it was a great experience for me. Um, you know, I, I think that the the the, that the players um, in search of uh, the right fit, and for us, it's always been about the, the the player development, the relationship. So you you've seen us you know have a few guys out of the portal that are that are are in search of a player development fit, right? That 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 really care about that aspect of it. For for us. I would, I'm more interested. We as a coaching staff have decided this and I think this is why you, you, you've seen us really move in this direction is I would rather build a program than a team annually, right? And, and those are two different things, right? We can build a program for a generation or we can build a team every year. I would rather not build a team every year because I don't know who we're getting. I don't know their lifestyle habits. I don't know... Um, uh, their, their background. I don't know a lot of different things. If I'm bringing in 15, 20, 30, you know, uh, transfers a year, right. You're seeing a lot of this, this massive movement. And, and so uh, if there's a player that, that we have a need, right. So we have a need, let's say we're, we're going to be impacted by the professional draft heavily in the next two years, which is awesome. And I'm very excited for that. But when you have something that comes through and you go through the draft and, and there's, you know, players that you didn't necessarily uh, bank on losing to the draft, then you're, you're looking for a player that fits your, uh, what you provide, which is for us, we value the player development aspect. So let's go find a guy that values player development, that wants player development, that he fits into the, the program philosophy um, and allow us to continue to build the program uh, over a long term, over the generation, right? And so I think with that in mind, we will always bring in majority high school players, and then we'll, we will find the, the fit that we need later in the process through the portal, um, still with the same mentality and mindset that, that fits our high school class. So um, it, it will, we will always have an eye to the, to the future to make sure that we, we're building this the right way, uh, to make sure that we're, we're not um, selling our future for the, the, the immediacy of it. Um, because I, I think you can get into a really tough cycle when you do that. You, you see that sometimes where you 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 put all your eggs in one bas in basket in one year. Um, your young guys don't play. Your freshmen don't have an avenue to get on the field. 
I think there's a difference in having an having an avenue on the field and being buried, right? So it's like if I have an avenue, it's going to be competitive. There may be three or four guys um, that that are in a two position cluster, right? There may be four infielders for two middle infield spots, but you have an avenue to get on the field. That's a lot different than and and and, and if they're in similar age, but it's a lot different than if I've got six middle infielders for two spots, four of which are juniors and seniors, and I'm a freshman. Um, so I think if as long as you keep your avenues open um, for young guys to play and you continue to add players that 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 take us towards our goal of building um, a sustainable elite program, I think the the portal, there, there are good kids in the portal that desire um, the, the, what we provide as well. And I guess there's two sides to that coin, Coach, because if you have someone who can't get on the field, Right. Or you have someone who excels more than maybe you thought he would. Right. With the new rules, with the easy, you know, transfer without having to sit now. How have you noticed that as far as, you know, retention, keeping them? Yeah. yeah. And and you're right. There, there are times where there are times where the a player is buried, right? For whatever reason. And he comes in and he says, Hey, listen, I'm I'm just I'm not gonna play. And there's a difference in being competitive and in in hey, it's you and this guy, you guys are gonna compete it out to get on the field. Right. And if that's the case, I'll tell a guy, I really think that you should stay and, and persevere through this because I think that competition will make you better. And if you want to become the player that you're capable of being, you're going to have to compete regardless. So <clears throat> there, there is that aspect of it. And then you get to where it's like, there's um, you're the bottom guy on the, on the pitching staff. And there's just not a there's not a navigable uh, way for you forward. And I understand what you're saying that you may need to go find somewhere that you're going to be able to get on the, on the field uh, more consistent. And I understand that, and that's a part of it. Um, you know, the the thing that 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 I think is a bit of an equalizer in in everything for 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 college baseball is the major league draft, where you you have you know you have an opportunity. Sometimes after your second year, if you're a draft eligible sophomore, but certainly after your third year, that if you are the caliber of player that um, is going to is going to receive financial reward and gains, you're going to be paid for those services um, a lot of money, right? And in and, and there's 20 rounds to be able to go through and say, all right, um, you know, I'd like to, you know, I'm going to have if I'm a, if I'm an elite player, I'm going to make two, three, four hundred thousand dollars as the floor. After my second, if I'm a draft eligible sophomore, uh, but certainly my third year, I think that's where that's where that's where college baseball is a little bit different. Is you, you have that opportunity to move forward into your professional career, um, where I think some other sports don't necessarily have as many opportunities at the per, at the professional level for that many players. Right, we have 20 rounds of of draft picks as opposed to to six rounds or two rounds in some of the other sports. Or in some of the sports, there's not a professional level necessarily that pays that pays well. Um, and so you, you're going to see some baseball guys that have an opportunity to be compensated financially, you know, a, a lot of money. And I think also is is being able to to become the player that you want to become is a product of obviously your work and your ability, but also in many ways, the environment that you're in that allowed you to grow and to learn and to become that great player. And so sometimes we, we we forget that the environment that we're from and the environment that we're in gives us an opportunity to grow in that way. And now we change the environment and, and we change the process. And oftentimes we change the product. And, and a lot of that will a lot of that will be told here in the next year or two because we're just kind of in the the beginning of this uh, kind of this the portal era in the way that it is, is you know, we have a lot of these guys that are in that have great coaches. And they have great environments and great programs and great processes. And they're in these and they become this terrific player that they've always wanted to be. And now we, we, we remove ourselves from that environment and what happens now, right? How do, do we still, are we still the player? Um, do we, do we continue to perform at that level? Do we, is it more difficult for us to play at that level consistently? I think time will tell, but I think professional baseball changes a lot of that because a lot of those guys are ready to go to the next level and they'll go move to that level um, when, when they're old enough to, to do so. Uh, so coach um, next year, mm -hmm. uh, you'll be the uh, opening series opponent for two of last year's college world series teams. Yeah. Um, that's going to be a tough test coming out the gate. 
So how, how would you define success for your team in those series? I know that's a, a tough, tough thing to ask because I'm sure you're looking for more, you know, development and things like that, but what, what are you looking for? Yeah. Well, the, the good thing about this team is we, we won't go onto the field and be terribly out talented anywhere in the country. We're, we'll, we're big enough, fast enough, strong enough, we're athletic uh, on both sides of the ball. So that won't, that doesn't concern me uh, uh, to, to be able to go into any environment and know that we can go compete on a physical level. Uh, the, the, the thing that when you schedule teams like this, and this is what I've always been such a proponent of this is if you want to go compete at a national level, you have to go play at a national level. And then you have to find a way to win at those games. You're, you're not going to those games to, um, to show up and to, like you said, kind of have a, hopefully a moral victory or to, to play well and to get better. You're going there because this is what, this is the level that we've all decided, you know, at Indiana, we want to compete for a national championship. Terrific. Let's recruit the best players we can. Let's put together the best player development processes that we can, and let's go play the best teams in the country. And until you go and do that consistently and annually, and then and then work to improve as you go through it until you're able to, to not only go and compete, but then to go and to win those series on the road, then you can't ever sit here and say that we want to we want to play for a national championship if we're not willing to go play teams that on an annual basis compete for a national championship. So we'll go down there and we'll play in those environments until we not only compete in those environments, but until we win in those environments. And then you continue to grow throughout the course of the season. Uh, to get better. So whatever you do in those first couple of weekends is the, the goal now is to take the information that you have from that experience and then to continue to grow. So if, like I told you guys uh, uh, when I was at Wright State a couple of years ago, we went down and we beat uh, we beat uh, a team that we, it was a kind of the shock, right? So we go take two out of three from a ranked team on the road in the, in the ACC. And, and I said, listen, the, this, the season's not over. The season's not over. Like they, they don't just crown you the national champion because you go and do this. Same thing the year that we were, you know, in 2019, we won the Big Ten. We went and we got swept early at, a, at, a, at an SEC program. And they didn't cancel the season after that weekend. We went on to win the Big Ten. So you just have to get better. I, I tell our guys all the time, the goal for us is to be the best team that we can be the last month of the season. Because if you do that, you're going to have an opportunity to not only play in the postseason, but then to succeed in the postseason. And that's what we have to do. And if we don't expose ourselves, if we're too terrified to expose ourselves to the most volatile environments and the most competitive teams, then we won't have the gumption, we won't have the toughness, and we won't have the confidence to compete in the postseason. And if we're just playing the games to try to make it to the postseason and not succeed in the postseason, then what are we trying to accomplish? You know, Bob, I want to win, and we all want to win. So we have to, be, we have to have the guts to do the hard stuff. And sometimes you get hit in the mouth and sometimes you hit somebody else in the mouth, but we're going to find out. Um, and, and that's kind of always been our philosophy. And, and what, what, what better way to do it than to go, than to go, you know, suit them up and, and, and play against the teams that have had a lot of success. Now on the, the other side, the hosting side of things, uh, 30 mm -hmm. games at Bart Kaufman field is absolutely the most aggressive home schedule we've seen yeah. and likely the most aggressive, uh, in the century and a half history of the program. Yeah. What was your thinking in that? I just wanted, uh, I wanted my wife and kids to be able to watch as many of the games as possible. So I uh, yeah, schedule it that way. No, um, you know, sometimes they, they, they kind of fall, this, the schedule falls uh, differently. You have home and away midweeks and those different things. Um, the, the, the reality of it is we had a, with all the kind of the realignment stuff that, that goes on in the conference schedule, that fourth and fifth weekend sometimes can be swing weekends. We had a, an away series that got canceled um, uh, kind of last year. And so we had the decision to make and uh, we ended up adding a, adding a home series there. It really wasn't, there wasn't, um, um, I'll always be an honest guy. There wasn't a, a, a terribly in-depth analysis of, uh, of the difference in those things. It was a kind of the best available at that time. Um, and we, we still have a game, you know, we're at 55 right now. So, um, we still have a game that, that we can schedule there to, to, to add a road game if we would like to or kind of whatever happens. A little bit heavy, um, but at the same time, you're, you sometimes you kind of dealt a hand as far as when somebody backs out on you that that, that late and, and you kind of end up with it. So there, there wasn't, I'll be honest with you, I like having some home games. I, I like having those things, especially after you have a really tough 
slate on the road early in the Northern team. And we have the advantage. We're kind of in that swing area where we're far enough south where we can play home games a lot sooner than most guys in, in the Midwest key. And so you're, you're, you're kind of in that position, but um, you know, it, 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 it kind of works its way out, you know, as we, as we kind of get into the season. Well, Coach, uh, you've been on record discussing, you know, a long-term vision for the program, um, yeah. you know, in regards to position players and hitting. Yeah. Uh, that progression um, is hard to argue with. Uh, your pitching has been consistent, even last year, uh, earning solid MLB uh, draft picks. However, the lack of strike throwing and the poor position depth, the, sorry, the, the poor pitching depth yeah. contributed to the first losing season in your head coaching career. Yeah. Um, how do you define where the, where the, where the program is now? Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome question. Um, so we are where I, I thought we would be now. I thought we would pitch it a little bit better last year. I thought we would have a, a more success last year. I, I think that was a, a, a bit um, for a couple of reasons, but re the reality is when our 2021 class was, was really the first class we had a chance to recruit start to finish and, and so we we kind of looked at that two or three years ago, actually right, really right before COVID is um, we wanted to allow that 21 class to kind of grow up together and play and, and to, to mature, right? And so that was the goal from the beginning. Now that was before COVID hit. We didn't know COVID was going to change everything and, and college baseball was going to end up with a bunch of 24, 25, and 20, 26 year olds running around. But um, once you kind of got into it, you, you you have to persevere. You have to go through it because that was your plan and, and that's how you you've built it. So um, we got had a chance to have the 21 class go through it uh, together and, and grow up and give a ton of experience. Um, you know, the, the, from, the, from a pitching standpoint, um, and we've talked about it before with the year before uh, we, we had five pitchers signed professionally. And then four of those guys in the top 10 rounds, not having the, the, the midweek games in that reduced season, it, it did hurt where, you just didn't have a chance to really evaluate the roster the way you normally would in, in, and that's my fault where you, you just, we just had not to your point, we didn't have enough depth. And so you end up um, with a, with an issue that you can't fix mid stream um, because it's, it's not on the roster currently. And so that was the, that was the mistake I made. We went out and recruited, you know, Jack Perkins and Bradley Bramer and they were both terrific, um, but without enough depth to be able to turn that it, it made it look like, Hey, um, we're not where we need to be necessarily. And I would understand that. I'm not, I'm not blind to that fact um, where you, you have an area where you don't have enough depth necessarily. And it makes it look like maybe you're not in the position that you had planned to be in. But I, I look at it now and you say, okay, so you kind of live and you learn. Um, but for as far as allowing that 21 class, which is very, very talented to, to go into play and to have a ton of experience. And those sophomores last year, you know, Hunter Jesse and Bobby Way on those guys to go into play last year. Um, and to, to go out and do what we did is really exciting. And then to add that 22 class on top of it, which is the best class in the conference and really, really talented. And, and to bring in some of those transfers that we did this summer on the mound that are you know, very, very talented. We're about where we where I thought we would be, where I would like for us to be from a, from a talent standpoint. It's a very, very talented group. Um, physically and then you know from a from a personality standpoint it's a very serious group it's a very committed group uh, a very intelligent group so um, I'm excited because we've gone through and like I talk about all the time I was talking about the players to build the foundation to build the program um, for, for a long-term success and so like it can annually be able to compete at a high level and so when the draft impacts you you're you're not you're not relegated to now we have to go use the portal um, and, or junior college in a way that we have to transform the roster every year after the draft. And so do we have the players in-house uh, to be able to allow us to absorb that loss to professional draft and then to allow those next guys to step right in every year and to become the same caliber of players? Well, the only way to do that is to, is to allow that, that young group to play, to grow up, and then to build that, and then to, to, to build on top of that with essentially the same level of recruit, the same level of player year after year after year. Um, and that was what we did last year. And I thought we would pitch better um, to allow us to, um, to, to kind of grow up together on both sides of the ball. Um, and, and, and we didn't have the depth on the mound to do that. But um, it, it doesn't take away from, from my confidence or my, my excitement for where we are today as a program. I also think, Coach, that 
for years and years, this program has had pitching where it was, you know, dominant and there were some stars on the, in the rotations and there weren't 15 to 14 games and there weren't maybe on a you know, midweek or a rare Sunday. Mm-hmm. I think it was just it was so drastic to what the fans are used to. And then to go into this, you know, lots of double digit games, not that we weren't scoring runs, right. but the pitching just wasn't what had been established. Right. right. And, and, you know, shame on you for not being prepared for COVID, you know, right. I get it. <laughs> Obviously that had a lot to do with it. You would explain yeah. that, yeah. but uh, specifically, I know you talked a lot about already, you know, the question was going to be what lessons were learned. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could you, can you touch on a couple maybe about specific pictures that you learned yeah. about maybe from going from beginning to end of the seasons? Because it yeah. really was a roller coaster ride on the mound. Yeah, it really was 100%. Uh, I, I think there are several things that you take away from it. First of all is, is as a coach, you, you, um, you never want to be – you believe in your system, you believe in what you do, but you never want to be overconfident and, and, and just assuming that those guys will take the natural progression. I think one thing that really became clear to me was – the process in which you you utilize to get there is incredibly important. So, and it's not the 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 pitching drill or the the, the track me and information as much as a um, couple of things. One is you have to play, and that's why it's so important that we go play in really difficult environments because a lot of times the emotional reaction that you can't replicate in any other way has more impact. Then, then you have any idea what it is until that is until that stimulus is taken away and then reapplied, and and so when when you lose that stimulus for the whole group of guys and then you reapply it, it, it was it's it's really it can be really dramatic, and so it, it, if I ever would have thought about re, like scheduling lighter or not putting guys in those situations, that was um, it, it just cemented that you you just they have to go through those things to be able to do it because we didn't we didn't pitch poorly in the fall or the winter. Now, you know, it's funny. I had a scout come up to me, a really good friend of mine. Um, and he's a, he's a, he's a very, very successful scout. He said, you know, with your pitching, if you guys could hit it all, you guys would host a regional. And that was about two weeks before the season. He said, you know, I just don't think you're going to be able to hit. And I said, well, we'll find out, you know, I, I don't know if we will or we won't, but, but, you know, it was kind of the, the kind of the inverse of that. So it wasn't necessarily that we saw a lot of that coming. Um, we didn't have a problem throwing strikes in, until I, kind of the season started. I think the environment, I think the other thing that I, I learned a lot of was um, that, that the way that you ap- apply your practice plans, even if your intentions are good, I think uh, you, you have to replicate um, that environment as closely as you can, even if you think you're replicating, uh, for example, uh, holding runners at, at second base. Um, so pitching with runners second base. So if you haven't done it, if you haven't done it a ton, it's a, it's a very, very stressful, uh, it's a very stressful part of the game. So you're, you're trying to get the, you're trying to get the sign from the, obviously the catcher. And it's like, you know, so it's the inning, the inning plus two wiggle this, right? So you have all these, you have all that. It's very, it can be very complex for the pitchers. And then like the, the middle infielder is, is, is holding the runner, um, and it, when's he in and when's he out? And then obviously you're trying to also manage just executing a pitch. So how, how do you, how do you replicate the stress of that environment? Even if you think you're replicating that environment, you're, you're probably not making it as difficult as it needs to be to, to elicit that emotional response that's causing, um, for, for a guy to not be able to, to, play at the, at the level he is accustomed to playing at. And so you, you have to make, you have to make sure that you are, that you're, you're really, really, um, even if you're practicing those things that you, you think is, is, is intense enough or is, um, is detailed enough, it, it probably is not. And so that was something that, that you kind of learn those lessons as you, as you go through something like that um, and making sure that you're able to really um, simulate and, and control the environment as much as you can to make sure those guys are able to, to, uh, to, to compete inside of that in, in uh, what's going to happen in a real game. So I think making sure you have the, the depth, like I said, um, making sure that you're, you're not just relying so solely on kind of your player development, but you also have the depth to be able to make sure you can withstand an injury, you can withstand somebody underperforming that you think is going to be able to, um, uh, to transition into those roles. 
and and then you're going to be able to really go out and, and make sure those guys are prepared um, from an emotional standpoint to compete inside of those environments um, that we didn't do a good enough job of last year. And in in those things, as as much as we want to talk about the reduced season, that's my fault. Those 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 are my responsibilities to make sure the roster has enough depth to to withstand somebody underperforming or an injury, and then to make sure that the the practice environments are um, stressful enough and and are detailed enough. Um, from a standpoint of like, it, this is exactly what it looks like and what it feels like to compete at that level. So um, I would say those are probably the, the three things that you take away from that. Okay, coach. So completely switching gears here. Um, the pending expansion of the league into the Los Angeles market, uh, maybe even more than that. Yeah. Um, what do you think that means to the, for your program, to the Big Ten? Yeah. Um, where do you see it? going i think it's a great thing i think it's terrific for for big 10 baseball um, when you go when you um when you you pick up programs like that that have such history that have such uh that, that have uh, such a high standard and expectation for how baseball is played i i think those things are, are really good for the baseball specifically i think it's really good for the conference overall um, you're bringing in, you know, obviously a, a massive, massive market. Uh, you're bringing in great, a couple, you know, great football. You're bringing in terrific basketball. You're, you're bringing in a lot of different, different pieces that are going to impact the league, you know, from a financial standpoint in, in, in the new contract and in, in a positive way. But you're also bringing in a market um, that's going to have a lot more eyes on the league. And, and I think that's a, a huge deal. I think from a, from a student athlete experience standpoint, um, you know, I know the travel, people bring up the travel a lot, but I mean, the, the kids are up till, you know, midnight or one o'clock in the morning, half the time anyway. Right. right? So yep. we all lived it, um, except now when you, when you wake up, you're in LA for four days. Right. So it's like, you know, wh wherever you're, 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 you're going out and you're experiencing different things and, and you're, you're getting to make memories that are a bit unique. So I think all those things are, are, are real positive. I think it opens up some, you know, recruiting avenues and recruiting opportunities uh, to be able to go out and, and we've, we've done a little bit, you know, we've, we've tried to really expand the recruiting base, right. We've tried to get out to, to California. We've tried to get to, you know, Virginia's and the Jersey's and, and kind of get the East coast and the West coast. We've done some Florida um, as of late. So I think when you have a footprint there, it, it makes it a little bit easier and, and it makes it a little bit of an easier sell. You know, you're going to play some games in front of your, your, your family and Hey, you're going to have to visit, you're going to have to visit the Midwest to play these games anyway. You know, you, you, you could do it, at, you know, at Indiana and, and not as a, um, as one of the schools in the West coast. I think that's a big deal. So I, I think it, I think it opens up a ton of opportunities for, for the big 10 to, to put um, it's, it's best foot forward. Now I'm, you know, in, in, in our world baseball um, to, to be able to have, uh, you know, just like the strength of scheduling, right. The RPI piece of yep. it where you just, you've got two programs that are going to step in and, and are going to be really, really successful. And that's going to, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. So now we're immediately, you're, you're having two um, teams that are annually in the, in the postseason that are in your league every year. Um, and so that, that lifts everybody around because now you're playing those guys and it, it lifts, it lifts our strength of schedule as a conference. It lifts our RPI as a conference. Uh, all those things are good things. All those things are good things. And, um, and, and I'm excited. I know as someone who uh, watched the year that uh, Cal State Fullerton and Long Beach State both came to, mm -hmm. to Indiana, I'm waiting for some of these Southern California teams to experience uh, yeah. Northern ball in yeah. March. And I'm just waiting yeah. for that one. Cause those, when, when you're seeing teams with dress codes, because they do not know, what the cold is going to be like right those get fun yeah well hopefully they bring it with them hopefully they bring some of that 75 and sunny with them and that's true or, or find that middle ground where it's cold right. to them but it's the best <laughs> days we've had so far that's right that's I, right. I like that plan that's right that's right uh, now coach uh we've heard uh that uh the big 10 conference office has taken steps to uh reassure the league coaches that baseball is very much a priority going yeah. forward. Uh, what are your thoughts on the state of the conference heading into this next season? Well, I would agree with that. You know, we, we've met with the, the, the league, the, the administration and, and, and whatnot, and, and they've, they've talked about, you know, obviously when we, when we had reduced some of the games and, and done those things, it was, 
it, it was hurtful as to the league overall. And I think that's, uh, that's an under, that's understand it. And we don't need to, I don't need to belabor the point, but you know, when it, when it comes to, to different aspects of, uh, you know, how do we continue to, to grow big 10 baseball? I mean, you look at, you look at the facilities, you look at the investment, you know, and we compete with Illinois, but you know, Dan Harlow is a, is a good friend and a, and a really good coach. They just opened a, a brand new facility. Obviously we have a terrific facility, um, you know, you look at the growth at Northwestern, a lot of different places. So, you know, it, 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 a lot of those things from the commitment from the administrators has, has been there and continues to be there. Um, you know, we, we have to continue to grow, um, you know, some of the other ancillary pieces of it, obviously continuing to work for us to get instant replay, which I feel confident is coming in the, in the very, very near future. Those kind of things are, are, are a big deal um, for, for us to continue to, uh, to have a, a wonderful conference tournament that we do, right? I think playing out in Omaha is a is a great advantage for us. I think it's a really good thing, and to continue to have that contract, right? Um, some of those different things that they're they're committed to doing, I, I think, is is really good, uh, you know, for us overall. But then also, like we just talked about, adding um, adding the schools uh, from the West Coast, I, I think, is a huge is a huge boost for uh, for us as a baseball league. So, yes, I, I I do think that there are some some things that um, you know, when they're, when they're announced, I, I think will be really exciting. You know, I, I, I um, I'm not going to break them necessarily today, but, um, and, I, and I know that's not what you're asking, but, but, uh, when, when they are, I, I they will be really exciting items for us. And, and I look forward to, to doing that, but I do feel very confidently, um, with the commitment from the league. And, and again, there, there has been that, those things, you look at, Indiana with our, our incredible facility and you look at Michigan with their, you know, your renovations and, you know, you're just looking across the league and you're seeing the commitment. Um, I, I think the, the reduced season kind of put a damper on some of that. Um, but we're, we're, we're pulling through those things now and in the meetings that we've had have been really, really positive and, and, and very exciting. And night games will be able to be a thing at Rutgers. Hey, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yep. They finally getting lights. Oh no. <laughs> Wait, but coach you're an indiana guy right you're yep. born and raised here right. if you could do something about maybe moving that little car race that happens around memorial day weekend <laughs> maybe we could have the big 10 tournament at victory field that would be i i've i've uh, i've mentioned that to no avail yet but i will continue to offer somebody else's facility for, for our, <laughs> <laughs> just move that little car race just get it hey, somewhere else. Yeah, I'm, you know, exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. No big deal. No. no. <laughs> I'm just saying it would be cool to have it there once in a while. It would be really cool. It would yeah. be really cool. It would be. It would be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. We talked about the recruiting class earlier. Yep. And you brought up the transfer guys coming in. Would you yeah. mind telling us about them and what you're excited yeah. about in, from yeah. those guys? Uh, I, I think on the mound for us, obviously we, we brought in a majority of those guys were, were on the mound. So I, you look at, we, we wanted to impact, we wanted to stay on schedule. And, and so with us, the, the, the 21 class, we wanted to add to each group, um, a little bit at a time. We, we really didn't want to go and, and bring in, you know, four or five or six grad transfers. And, and again, you want to build a program and not a team every year. So, you look at those that sophomore group. Luke Center uh, is is as talented of an, as an arm as, as there will be in the league. Um, he he is he's he's very very good. Um, the, you know, six foot eight, low to mid nineties, two two or three plus off speed pitches. It's it's really talented. Um, Cooper Hellman is is big and really really talented. A, a lot like uh, Bradley Bramer's profile. Obviously, Bramer was a was a fourth year guy last year. That um, you know the last month he was. He was incredible. He was terrific. So um, that was uh, kind of the idea with him. Just the track man stuff was really good. Now he's got to continue to, to improve. He's got to be a better strike thrower and, and those kind of things. But he's got really good stuff. Adrian Vega as a sophomore uh, was the biggest freshman of the year from from Butler. He threw against us, uh, had a, has a really unique fastball. When he gets above 90, that the induced vertical break really, really creeps up on you. Um, and and it's 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 got enough property to it. His changeup is a good pitch to begin with, but but the, his fastball when he gets above ninety really creates problems for you with the changeup. It's a it's a it's a borderline plus pitch. Think of uh, a lot like Gabe Bierman when Gabe was young, um, or you where he's now Gabe to the sinker, but a lot like that where it's um 
you know, it's a six one, it's a six one six one repeatable righty strike thrower. Uh, now he though again, Gabe was a sinker baller and Adrian's a is a forcing guy, but change up cutter, the cutters really come on strong. So you like those three, you like those three guys out of out of that group. Uh, Brooks I um, was a was a weekend starter at Fordham and then was in the NECBL this summer and was an all-star in the NECBL as a closer. So you, you're looking at out of the bullpen, you're looking at, you know, low to mid 90 stuff. Now his, his stuff was down this fall. Um, he had a huge workload in the spring and a huge workload in the summer. So he he was more in the 88 to 90 range and in, 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 uh, just kind of working his way back. But all indications are over the offseason, he's been 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 really good. So excited to, to kind of see him, you know, wh- wh- which way he kind of ends up uh, going from there. Nate Ball is left-handed pitcher from Youngstown. That, that I'm excited about. They're they're rework, they're working with some stuff with him. I think he's a little bit more of a. Um, we'll see. He could come out and, and be ready to go the first week or two. But just some bigger mechanical changes, um, some bigger mechanical changes for him. But I think in the long term for him, for his collegiate career, and hopefully if he has a chance to play at the next level for his long term career, I think will be a, a benefit for him. Um, but but I, I like him and the left-handed pitcher out of, out of Youngstown State. Seti, uh, Seti Manasse from um, from Tacoma is uh, is a really exciting guy for us. It's a it's an elite strike thrower. You threw like you know eighty innings and, and walked ten guys or you know something. It was the um, the the NWAC pitcher of the year, which is a big deal because that's a that's a really really good pitching league up there. Played for a great a great coach who's a good friend of mine out of Tacoma, Ryan Mummer. So it's a you know 88, 91 uh, on a fastball elite command. Uh, with a with a really really good splitter, which is a bit unique for, to have a guy with a um, with a splitter. But he is a huge he is a huge huge man, uh, huge hands. I mean he is he, he could play. I, I don't want him to work out when the football team works out because if you know if uh, Coach Allen oh, yeah. <laughs> six foot five two hundred and sixty pound monster you know working out he, we'd never get him back. But um, you know, he, he's just, he's an elite strike thrower, uh, you know, very, very competitive, throws a plus splitter and a good slider. And, um, I mean, he was, he was lights out this fall. So he was really good. So th- those guys, um, you know, from that kind of that senior group, you know, Ben Seiler was a, was a Friday guy at Siena and, and pitched really, really well. Set the access at the national record last year, I think for strikeouts in the game with 19 or 21 game. And, uh, he threw against Maryland, threw really well, and, and threw against Central Florida, threw really well. So, uh, you know, hopefully his velo is in the, you know, 88 to 91 range, got a good little slider, good curveball, plus changeup. Just like the consummate pro, if you think of, you know, uh, T- Tommy Summer is a is probably a, a comp, right? You know, and again, Tommy was terrific, and I'm not saying that, that um, I'm just talking about profiles, right? You know, Tommy was incredible right i'm not saying that ben's going to be tommy i want to put that on him but the guy that can throw a fastball to both sides and throw a change up and multiple off speed pitches has a nice pickoff move he, he can just really manage the game um and, and so i think he's 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 kind of in that mold and then gabe gabe levy uh, out of davidson is i mean he's terrific he's he's terrific he's 90 92 plus plus change up good curveball good slider um probably the most pitchable guy that we have on the staff and, and the most pitchable guy that we've had maybe in my, my time at Indiana, um, you know, Paulie Milto, I saw Paulie the other day, we were up doing a camp in Indianapolis and kind of made me think of it where you, you just, you, you, you never get the same pitch twice and it's really hard to square up and hard to, to hit and he can hold the runners and super competitive. So probably a, a lot in, in, in that vein with a, with a better curveball. Um, not not Tommy, or I'm sorry, uh, you know, Paulie. Again, these guys are terrific players and and some of the all time greats. So I'm not saying they're going to be like that, but again, pitching profiles. So uh, you know, th- there's a couple more in there, but those are you know some of the the, the main guys. And I I think that the way that they'll impact um, the the team is on on the field will be terrific. But they they've really impacted and been been terrific guys. You know, off the field, I think any time that you 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 bring some of those guys in, you're, you're always concerned about how they impact the culture and how they impact the, the clubhouse. And that's always something that we, 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 we keep at the forefront of it because there's, 
you know, there's, a, you know, eight or nine freshmen, right? You know, Reisdorf is going to be terrific. I mean, he is going to be, he's going to be something else. And, and you want to make sure the guys that are in there with him are, are the right kind of guys, the right character, the right integrity. And you, you don't want to just want to and go, you know, overreact, right? Okay, so, uh, you know, we didn't pitch the way, we didn't have the depth on the mound. Our, our high-end guys last year were really good. You know, Bothwell could have signed if he wanted to for for good money and those three draft picks. So the high end was good, didn't have the depth. And then we overreact and we go we go do something and the pendulum swings too far. And now we've made a mistake. Um, and, and you don't put good guys around, you know, Reisdorf and, you know, Katsky and, and, and these young guys, Phillips, that are going to be really good pitchers into the future. Um, you want to make sure that you you continue to have uh, quality quality individuals. So that's what I, I feel really good about with these kids too. Coach, did you have anything else that we didn't cover that you'd like to to share with uh, with the fan group? No, I would say it was pretty. Uh, uh, we, we we were we were pretty thorough. We were pretty. Yeah. Thorough <laughs> today, so, no, I, I appreciate it, um, and I appreciate you guys and the candor and being able to talk about some of those those different things and. Uh, you 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 live and you learn through some some pieces and you know just like uh, you know I've talked with our with our hitting you with our you know, position coaches about some of the adjustments that we made from two years ago offensively to last year offensively and you know you look at the last month of the the season in that twenty what was the twenty twenty one where we didn't swing it as well we had the you know best pitching staff in the country and didn't swing it as well and. And so you go out and you you evaluate, you make adjustments, and then you you move forward, and you move forward better and smarter and stronger, and 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 uh, and then you apply that, and you look at that, you look at this past year, where you, past year's success offensively is because of, in many ways, because of what you learned in 2021 through some of those struggles and failure. Well, nobody wants to struggle. Nobody wants to not pitch. I understand that. But you end up having success because of the things you learn. And once you find it, then you, you, you're you able to improve dramatically and then keep it, right? I didn't want to not hit, um, you know, being the hitting coach in 2021. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't a whole lot of fun there for the last couple of weeks. But you end up finding a lot of things that are positive that, that will last a generation. So, you know, that's what I get excited about is living and learning and growing and improving. Um, and I know this, I, I know this group of kids is, um, is, is a really, really good group. I know it's talented, but I'm, I'm, I'm telling you the way they play, the way they compete, the, the character, the, just who they are is unique and is special. Um, and it's something that I'm really proud of. And I, and I think it'll show on the field this spring. Well, that is, that's awesome, coach. We really appreciate you taking the time with us and we're definitely looking forward to, to, to seeing that group. All four of us are going to be down in Auburn. So we're looking forward awesome. to, to, to being there in February and, and, and seeing this kind of all, all come together. Awesome. Um, so again, well, thank, thank you. you, coach. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And again, I'm thankful and appreciative and I look forward to, to, to seeing you guys down there and um, hope everybody has a happy new year as well. Same to you. Coach. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for listening to Talking Hoosier Baseball. Uh, for more on Indiana University Baseball, hit up iubase.com. Uh, so, again, thank you to, to Coach Mercer. Uh, for Chris Feeney, Josh Bennett, and Cassidy Palmer, I'm Carl James. See you at the BART.